it is just a huge honor for me to be podcast interviewing a legend, Dr. Paul Willett. Thank you so much Thank for you, coming Howard, by. For me. Dr. Paul Willett has dedicated his life to his profession as an educator, online entrepreneur, inventor, and leading proponent of the implementation of cutting edge technology applications in dentistry. He currently serves on the faculty of a major orthodontic department teaching his residents interdisciplinary orthodontics, implant dentistry, and multi-specialty practice management. Dr. Willett presents high energy, entertaining podium presentations and one day or more workshop programs on current 3D dentistry topics such as 3D CBC dentistry today and tomorrow. Placeholder of TAD, implants used to preserve crustal bone levels, adjunctive orthodontic techniques for preparing implant receptor sites, easy flapless guided implant surgery protocols, accelerated orthodontics and surgical facilitated orthodontics, practice management of the group specialty practice. Um, he was, uh, oh my God, how many, how many dental offices have you started in your lifetime? Uh, 30. Uh, orthodontic offices. Well, no, I, I had multi-specialty uh, centers uh, mainly and um, so 33 offices is what I uh, He had 33 counted. offices. You're trying, well, to, you're trying to figure time. out. Not all at one time. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, um, and then you were friends with um, Gaspar Lazarus, who started Orthodontic Centers of America. Uh, we go back uh, over 40 years, and then Dr. Robert Pickren, Pete Pickren. Uh, the three of us were kind of the, uh, um, the, what do you call it, the pioneers of um, marketing and advertising and orthodontics, giving away bicycles and things like that to get patients in. Uh, this is pre-internet, um, uh, which internet makes it a lot easier now. And uh, I'm not saying that I was the brains behind it because Gasper and Pete were the ones that uh, really took it to the next level. Uh, Dr. Pickering just uh, sold 23 of his offices about six years ago. In, in Atlanta, in Atlanta, Atlanta Georgia. Uh -huh. And he's retired uh, teaching. His son's now an orthodontic resident at the Georgia School of Orthodontics. I was teaching in Jacksonville for a couple of years where my son became an orthodontist from JU, Jacksonville, Jason Olette. And then my other son's a dentist, an implant dentist, and sedation dentist trained with uh, Dr. McCracken in Alabama. And uh, he, he went to school offshore. Ryan, can you find those? They and you graduated from Loyola School of Dentistry in Chicago, 1970, with your DDS. Yes. And then in 72, graduated Loyola School of Dentistry in orthodontic specialty and master's of science in oral biology. Mm -hmm. So you were a... Um, orthodontist in 1972 mm -hmm. and um, how would you say um, and by the way th that original three he was talking about which was uh, with Pete Pickering in Atlanta and Gasper Lazarus Gasper lives in Ponte Vedra, Ponte Vedra Florida but wasn't he originally from uh, New Orleans he was from New Orleans yeah mm -hmm. and um, he those guys started Orthodontic Centers of America which was the only one to date that made it on the New York Stock Exchange, mm -hmm. the only one, mm -hmm. and it made it to a one billion dollar market cap, mm -hmm. and uh, and and today there's uh, so many DSOs, and mm -hmm. none of them could get publicly traded. Casper's a genius. Yeah, and it, it started out. Uh, I got contacted in Atlanta. Um, I had Atlanta Orthodontic Care Center, so I a in the phone book. So Gillette Corporation calls up says, hey, we're kind of interested in getting into your field. Would you be interested in talking with us? So they flew somebody down from Boston, and I started talking with them. So I wrote up a business plan, and I brought in Dr. Lazera, and I brought in Dr. Pickren, and we spent a year with the MBAs um, putting together a, a plan for multi-centers. And then uh, there was a, some sort of a hostile takeover that was happening to them, so they divested of their medical businesses. And so Lazera then picked the ball up and did it. So he was the first uh, DMO or uh, corporate uh, entity, and he's the billion dollar guy. And then Dr. Pickren started Orth Alliance, which I was a member of that as Sorry, well. Sorry, Ortho Alliance. Ortho Alliance, and that was. Um, Can you find Ortho Alliance, Ryan? Now, most of those are gone now. I mean, they, is Ortho Alliance gone? It's gone. Uh, oh, okay. But uh, Ortho Care Centers it, right? of America actually acquired it. Orthodontic Centers of America? Right. And uh, then there was one called Apple Orthodontics as well. So there was three in the orthodontic area, and I, actually, I was a, a member of all three of those. I participated in all okay, three. Okay, now this is Dentistry mm -hmm. Uncensored. Mm -hmm. I don't mean it insult her in any way, but mm -hmm. um, they all are out of business now. Most and, of them. And mm -hmm. now... Um, 
Kind of the you know the history just the pendulum just swings back and forth. Mm -hmm. So now you have a bunch of DSOs again, mm -hmm. but none of them. Wall Street won't take any info. There's none of them trade on Nasdaq. Mm -hmm. There's none of them trade on. And by the way, someone sent me a deal today, Howard. You're wrong. There is burner management, but no, that's a low volume. I mean, there's mm -hmm. that. That's that. Technically, you're right, and I'm wrong. But uh, but but they're all gone. And like you take the biggest one, like Heartland Dental. Like, mm -hmm. um, what what is that investment group? KK. Who, who just bought Heartland? Was it KKR? Yeah. And can you find me everything KKR owns in uh, dentistry? Because um, they bought what else did they buy? Demand Force. But anyway, um, so private equity. KKR just bought Heartland Dental. Mm -hmm. But in your guys' day, they went publicly traded. And then they failed, and and today's they they're all owned by private equity. They're all VC. Uh, so so let's yeah. talk about first. Why do you think they failed? What what le what business lessons could you share with the next generation? Well, well, the, stock, the right stock market took wrong? a big dump. I think in around two thousand or a little before two thousand. March of two thousand. Was it March of two thousand? Uh -huh. And I think that was uh, part of it. And then also uh, the doctor's stock, they depended on their stock price going up for giving up a percentage of their gross to the management company. And the stock uh, didn't really take off as fast as the doctors would like. So a lot of the doctors sued and got out of their arrangements. So that's, that's kind of what happened. And I'm now with a, with a VC uh, D4C, den uh, Dentistry for Children. And um, also uh, dental brand, what is it, uh, Family Orthodontics, and uh, they have 60 offices. I cover th about three of the offices right now. What, what, As an associate, I love it. I don't have to run it. it it's called what? Uh, D4C. Just D? And what? Dent dentistry for Children, D? and then Family Orthodontics, and it's Dr. Pickren's old practice. is the 23 I told you about. Yeah. And then... Ronnie Eichel, who's a genius as well, he's a pediatric dentist, he sold his pedo centers, and so they put ortho and pedo together, and it is awesome. I have 12 new patients every single day, just like clockwork. I don't have to pay the bills, I don't have to worry about staff, they take care of everything. And so for my next 47 years of practice, I'm gonna be with them. So have you been doing it 47 years? I'm in year 47 now. Nice, that is awesome. So, um. You know, podcast people are younger. By the way, um, please send me an email, howard at dentaltown.com. Tell me um, how old you are, where you live, what country you're from. And, um, and also, remember um, to watch this. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. But, but people our age, I mean, you know when you get on an airplane, the guy next to you is reading a book. Mm -hmm. You don't have to ask if he has grandchildren. You, you, you don't mm -hmm. know that. But it's the millennials. They're they're all doing the podcast YouTube mm -hmm. thing. What? How is orthodontics different today than in 1972? Well, in 1972, I guess it was kind of the golden age of orthodontics. We did not realize it uh, because it was a referral uh, type of relationship with your um, your family dentist and your other specialists. And you'd go to dental society meetings. You would lunch the doctors. Uh, lots of PR being done. Um, there was no emails back then, so we would do letters. Uh, and, and of course, when we, got, when we got laser printers and our letters started looking like printed pages, that was huge because orthodontists could afford to buy the laser printer. I, my first laser printer was an Apple and it cost me $5,000 just for the printer. And uh, so I always myself would try to embrace new, new technology. New technology. Um, when the internet happened, I was able to get a couple URLs, which have been huge for us, dentalspecialist.com and affordablebraces.com. And so when I sold my last um, six practices, I did not, I held those out for my boys. So Jonathan got dental specialists and Jason got affordable braces. And so they used that. And uh, of course now uh, Google is uh, the 800-pound uh, gorilla that you, that you have to market with that now. I don't have to worry about that anymore. We have a whole marketing department that does the PR. So I have somebody that comes by maybe once a month and we go and see three doctors. We take them to lunch. Um, they do the donut runs and everything. Uh, and we try to you know, meet as many of the doctors as we can. So we're still trying to do the personal relationships. But most of the dentists now are doing Invisalign. So our um, referrers are actually our competitors now. But that's OK. We can still you know, do difficult surgical cases. Uh, 
maybe we'll, we won't make as much profit, but it's sure a lot of fun doing the more difficult cases. Well, well let's talk about that because when Orthodox talk about they're losing a lot of cases to Invisalign, if you look at the Invisalign stock, I mean, that, that's a billion dollar market cap. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I look at, and let, let's go back to 1972. You graduated in 72 mm -hmm. as an Orthodox. I was born a decade before that. Mm -hmm. um, and back in those days, Big old families, you know, like, like my family, five sisters and a brother, seven kids. Only the most gnarly looking child would the family pay for ortho because you didn't have enough money to go out. But now it's like the family size are two kids. Everybody gets ortho. It's a fashion statement. Every, every, every woman <laughs> that gets divorced wants to come in and get bleaching and Invisalign. So I, I, I look at the Invisalign data. I listen to Joe. Is it Joe Hogan, Ryan? The CEO of um, Invisalign, Joe Hogan. That's right, yeah. So it's Joe Rogan is the uh, MMA fighter, announcer, and Joe Hogan. And, um, I, I mean, Ryan and I have been shocked. I mean, we'll, we'll be um, lecturing in Cambodia, Malaysia, Indonesia, and the 22-year-old and the waitress mm -hmm. in this poor country, and Has she's wearing Invisalign. Mm -hmm. So it looks like the Invisalign market is growing so fast. Is, it, is there enough for orthodontists and general dentists, or do you really see the general dentists really um, taking a bite out of the orthodontist well, um, grocery? But I also see today. Invisalign taking a bite out of the market as well through the Smile Direct Club. And how, they bought 17% of that? Uh, 17 to 19% of it, and uh, they are doing the exactly the same plan they did when they launched Invisalign. They spent like $40 million a year. I, I might not have the right numbers, but it was a huge amount of money on advertising, and they drove patients to the dentist chair or to the orthodontist chair. And then there was the uh, lawsuit that the dentists uh, said, hey, it's not fair that you know, you're only doing Invisalign for specialists. And uh, then uh, Align Tech uh, decided that uh, they, they would uh, settle the suit, and now they're doing it for the generalists, doing, still doing it for the specialists, and now they're uh, doing it directly to the public. And uh, so there are competitors now as well. So the market's really getting complicated. But that's why multi-centers and implant dentistry is the future, in my opinion, and that's kind of where what our family is focusing. What is the future orthodontics and what implant dentistry? Uh, implant dentistry is like one of the, um, yeah, I, I don't know what the percentages are, but there's very little uptake because it's so expensive. And that's one of the things I'm trying to do is bring the cost down of implant dentistry so that a patient can afford to get an implant and a crown and um, the system that I developed. Um, this is the one you developed? Yes. It, well, go through, your, go through what you developed. Okay, well, first of all, I'll show you the cover of this. But anyways, this, this basically shows uh, how an implant can be put in by somebody. Uh, an orthodontist does not do shots. They don't do flaps. They don't do sutures. All we do is point our fingers and tell our very talented uh, technicians to do you know, what we want them to do because we use our brain. So I try to develop a, a technique of putting implants in that me, an idiot, as far as a dentist goes, I haven't you know, done the shots and all that. My son, Jonathan, loves to you know, lance an uh, abscess, and he, he describes it to me, and I get sick. But anyways, so uh, everything can be done with hand tools. You don't have to have a $4,000 motor. So I have everything designed to where this will fit into a $4,000 motor if you want to you know, buy an implant motor. So it has a, uh, a latch on it, and that, that's an osteotome. Nice. And then it also fits into a handle. So here, I, I, can, I do missions, so if you can go out into the field and do dentistry and put implants in without having you know, all the stuff that you need. So I developed a surgical guide uh, technique to where all my instruments are designed from the tissue punch to go through the guide. And, and so a, a, an orthodontist can um, work with a company like Anatomage, and they will go ahead and set up the guides for you if you want to put an implant in. Is Anatomage who you recommend? Well, this is who I started with when I was doing this. Out of San Fran? Or uh, out of San Fran, San yeah. Fran. yeah. Um, I, I went out there right when, he, when Jack first started his company. I was out there, um, and also uh, Bob Boyd had a lot to do with Jack being where he is today, too. Jack's the uh, CEO? Yeah, Choi, Jack Choi. You think you can get him to come on the show? Well, I haven't talked to Jack in a long time, so um, I, I, I will touch base. Uh, with They've him. got so much exciting new stuff. Oh, they're, 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 that's a, a really good company because they're into the medical um, anatomy tables and right. everything. And their software is awesome. They have, they're the ones that came out with 3D cephalometrics. 
And I, I did an early study with 3D cephalometrics to show that uh, everybody has anatomical variations, so we're not going to get perfection in our ortho cases because you can superimpose the right half on the left half, and there's so much variation um, that um, you know teeth are different sizes, the bones are different size. So we're, we're lucky we get the results we do with uh, what we know. And now. I hear it's worse in um, countries like America and London and Canada and Australia, where mm -hmm. everybody's a mixed mutt. Yeah, well, we're, we're pretty a, mixed in the U.S. too. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. Versus mm -hmm. a country, I mean, you go to some countries, like, like if you go to Vietnam, they're 95% Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. You come to America, Canada, London, Australia, yeah. they're 100% mutts. What, what's 57, Heinz 57? You know, yeah, 50, yeah. 57 so, varieties. So it's very the... So anyways, to get to this, I designed the implant. It's called a TAD plant. TAD means temporary anchor device and plant from implant. So it's basically a TAD and I didn't design it with, um, so it would super integrate. It goes in like a post-it note, uh, you know, like a, you stick a post-it note on the wall, it's not gonna take the plaster off. It's not gonna, hold, it's not gonna harm the implant site. So you can put these in. Uh, it has a prosthetic platform. It also has a scan body, so you can scan it with a three shape um, software or, or some of the um, software, lab softwares and have a crown made for it. But everything's provisional, everything's temporary. Usually PMMA is what I use, but you could put a permanent crown on PMMA. it. PMMA. Um, polymethyl methacrylate, which is plastic, you know, acrylic. And, and so the, the implant goes in, this can go in and this could, could be a pediatric implant. They say you can't put implants in in young children because you might stunt their growth or, or harm the implant site. Well, there's ectodermal dysplasia patients where they're missing multiple teeth and what do you do for these kids? Uh, so they, they actually are putting full-size implants in those patients. There's several articles that show that. So I went ahead and made a very, very small implant. This is the, how small it is. And I had all these developed in Korea with a company that's been doing this for 30 years. And um, they do wonderful manufacturing. And um, the, the company that I'm dealing with um, was FDA approved for their line of big boy implants. These are either pediatric or temporary implants that will hold the bone, it'll hold a crown, and you can back it out easy. My, my son is taking one of my uh, clinical trial cases. Um, has, she's had it in for four years. And uh, it's coming out, uh, it either came out this week or it's coming out next week. And then he's going to put the more permanent ones in there because she's in her 20s now. And, but the, the reason that orthodontists uh, should be looking and helping out in implant dentistry is because we study growth and development. We know how the maxilla is a moving target. It is remodeling into the 30s and 40s. And, and so a lot of doctors are putting in a permanent implant that's so integrated, they have to use a trephine to cut it out, like a hole saw and cut it out. Uh, they have to graft it. And I had one case uh, that I was w working with a periodontist that I used in one of my lectures. He gave me all the uh, slides and everything. Uh, the patient spent about $8,000 having a lateral taken out and having all the surgeries he had to do. So this poster was presented to the ICOI, um, International College of Oral Implantologists in 2015 won first place. Nice. And so then I got invited to do main podium at the Trump uh, Doral in 2016. Where was the Trump Doral? Uh, that's down in Miami. Yeah. At the Trump Resort? <clears throat> uh, yes. Is that where <clears throat> Trump goes when he's going to? No, no, he goes to Mar-a-Lago, Mar -Lago, which is up uh, near Palm Beach. But it's another Trump Resort. He's got resorts all over the place. Now he has one on, what's the, what's the name of the avenue there? <laughs> <clears throat> the White House, but um, anyways, Pennsylvania Avenue. This this shows how the implant is put in with hand instruments, or it can be put in with motors, with um, with a surgical guide. Okay, now I see how that mm -hmm. would make sense and everything in the soft maxilla. Mm -hmm. But what about the mandible? Oh, sure, you can put them in anywhere. Really? Yeah, yeah, because um, now, now the hand instruments are designed like the osteotome. You just tap it once, you break the cortical plate. And then these are self-tapping. You just screw it in slowly. It expands the bone as it goes in, and you can load it right away if you're going to like move a tooth with it, or, now, if, you, or if you want to put a crown on it. This is a question um, mm -hmm. that comes on Dental Town every day. Mm -hmm. So you, you have an idea. Mm -hmm. 
Like, let's just use the implant companies. Like, what percent of implant companies would do an original manufacturing of your idea? Because a lot of dentists sit there and say, well, I'm afraid if I go to a big implant company and there's tell them my it. idea that they're going to steal the idea. Well, there's a thing called an NDA, you know, before you divulge anything, and you also get a patent. I have two patents on it But right did now. you get... Did you get two patents and an NDA before you talked to a Korean implant manufacturer? Well, no, I went offshore and had somebody in Korea that I met somehow through meetings. Right. And uh, he helped me out. Um, Patrick Kim is his uh, American name, Patrick Kim. He's excellent. He and I have a handshake. He, he is not going to steal it. I wouldn't, you know, I, like he doesn't want me to go to another company. I already have talked to another company this week that's, oh, well, we'll do it for you. And I said, well, you have to call Patrick Kim and talk to him. But, did, but before you talked to him, did you already have patents? My, my I mean, last, uh, I just in the last, it took me five years to get all the patents. And I still have one patent left. But he was making it for you before you had the patents? Yes, yes. Because I was doing clinical trials at Jacksonville. And Georgia School of Orthodontics, we just opened, so we, we don't have any research going yet, but we will. So one of my uh, doctors I recruited that's teaching there, she's going to go ahead and do clinical trials. Uh, and is this in Atlanta? This is in Atlanta, with, with permission of the chair of the department. I don't want to say she's going to do it, but we're going to try to get permission. Uh, the only thing I have left to do is a 510K uh, FDA, and then I'm ready to go to market. And, uh, and the way I'm going to... Um, package it, it's not going to be an individual uh, vials with a number on it. It's going to be like a bone screw. So it's going to be in a bone screw kit, so you'll have all the sizes that you need. You'll have the surgical instruments. There's only like three or four instruments you need to put them in. And um, you don't have to have numbers on it. The, page, the um, user sterilizes it, so that takes the sterilization out of it. So you can keep the packaging cost down because it's going to be in a bone screw kit. And so a, a bone screw, like there's little plates that can be put in for fractures and so on. Well, as orthodontists, we put plates in with a couple screws to do traction. And so my system, um, I'll be able to have a bone screw as part of it, and I can put the plates in, and we're going to use it for sleep apnea patients as well to advance their maxilla. And, and so um, it's a temporary implant. You don't want to put a permanent implant to, to treat a sleep apnea patient. You want to be able to get it out. And the nice thing about the TAD plant, if the body's changing and the maxilla is growing away from the implant and you're getting the exposure of the, um, the buccal surface there, you can back it out and put another one in or you can put a permanent implant in if the patient's old enough. And that should be uh, close to 30 and over. And then what happens after 30 and you get to be 40, there's a thing that I'm an expert in that's called aging. And you get, <laughs> you get older. And, and so the, the, I read all the stuff um, that I could get my hands on about aging in the mandible and, and how the implants are getting exposed because the mandible's changing as we age as well. And so I have a lot of uh, references in my lectures that show that we have a moving target we're working on. So why are the companies pushing super integrated implants in areas where they might have to be taken out? You know, you, you can really, you can spend $8,000 when you take one out and you have to recraft it and reestablish the site. You can also use teeth to build uh, implant sites. So that's adjunctive orthodontics that I like to do. So I, I might take a cuspid and move it all the way up against the central and then move it all the way back and we develop an implant site. Um, Dr. Uh, uh, the, down in Washington, um, one of our great um, contributors in orthodontics, um, I can't think of his name, uh, Vince uh, Kokic. Kokic. He died. Uh, his son lectures uh, now. Uh, he would be somebody good to get on your show as well. He's, well, you introduce us. Well, I don't know him as well. I'm just telling yeah. you of the, of the great uh, minds in, uh, in orthodontics that, um, you know, is kind of, they're experts in Did you find history. him, Brian? And um, Vince was the, uh, he was the editor of our journal of orthodontics. He was the dad. He's the dad. He passed uh, maybe two, three years ago. He was a great man. And what's his son's name? I don't know his first name. But is he in Washington, D.C.? I think he's, he's out there in D.C. Uh, we, we had him in Jacksonville. He came to Jacksonville and lectured to the Dental Society. Was it Vincent? No, well, it could be Vincent Jr. Yeah, Vincent Kovic Jr. Okay. Nice, right? Okay, so he, he takes his dad's name. And so, by the way, to you like millennials, do you realize that when we were your age, the best we could do is go to the biggest downtown library where they had all these phone books. Mm -hmm. And if you were looking, if we were just, just to have this conversation in the 80s, we'd have gone down there 
and pull up a bunch of them. Was he in D.C.? And you what were those little the, cards you used to oh get? With you, know, you had to go through all the cards and go find the books. I remember sometimes I'd want to go to a dentist. I'd go down to the Phoenix <laughs> Library and look at 20 different phone books. Because you knew he was from, like, Virginia. Yeah. So you had to look at 10 different Virginia phone books trying to find some dentist name in front of her. So this, this shows how I have animations that show the surgical guide being used manually and uh, with a motor. I have over 30 some uh, instruments and, uh, and components for the system that have developed over the last five years. And then this is exciting. Um, this patent is called ortho veneers. And so what it is, it's basically a veneer, a crown, or a bridge that designed with a monolithic integrated orthodontic attachment on it. So you just design it on the software. I've been using three shape software and we have a library. We, we put a brace on it and then we 3D print it um, and either additive or subtractive printing. And uh, the materials weren't there when we first started with this idea. The materials are here. So there are materials that are uh, FDA approved that can be used in the mouth over 24 hours. Uh, so Align Tech owns Invisalign and Itero. Yes. But you um, sen seem to be mentioning three-shape. You, you, it sounds like you like the three-shape oral scanner better than the... No, not necessarily because both my sons, uh, my, my one son, Jonathan, uh, is a CEREC instructor, so he has Serona, CEREC. Dense by Serona, okay. CEREC. He also has an Itero for his Invisalign cases, and my son, uh, Jason, just bought an uh, Itero Element. That's a new one. And he, he practices with a uh, super guy I, I should get you, and I will introduce you to him, uh, Dr. Joel David and Associates. He's in um, Jacksonville. He's probably the largest uh, user of Bio uh, Horizons implants. I believe he's one of the largest users. Out he's, of Alabama. He's one of, no, no, this is uh, North Florida. This no, is, no, um, Bio Horizons oh, company. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and they, they also support the course where my son was uh, taught with Dr. McCracken. So my son is Bio Horizons all the way. That's all he uses. So, so you think the oral scanners are pretty much, you're okay with dense flight Serona, Itero, mm -hmm. or 3Shape? 3M, I've used 3Ms. 3Ms, I've used Care Streams. So I, I've had three scanners uh, that I had to buy in my research because everything's scanned. And so uh, there, there are cases that, let's say a bombed out case comes in and um, the, the patient uh, has to have some of the teeth removed they might need some dental implants, but, you know, the teeth tip, and so the orthodontist has to, you know, upright them. Well, the case needs to be, like, cleaned up, and so the ortho crown is done in, in temporaries, but you put the orthodontic appliance, you design it into the crown, you straighten the teeth, and then you buff off the attachments, and now you have a temporary veneer that we can bond a little clear wire. And then the patient, as they can afford it, they can have this quadrant replaced, that quadrant replaced. So that's the ortho veneer, ortho crown system. That patent is about ready to come out, uh, hopefully, uh, this, uh, this summer. Uh, we had to do a couple revisions. So here's some uh, images of the ortho veneer, ortho crown. Uh, and you don't have to have an orthodontic uh, bracket. Uh, I have some in the patent description where I have a stair step uh, slots on the tooth. And so if you want to do guided bone regeneration, you want to extrude a tooth, you just put it up, it's like a ladder. You put the wire up into the first one, you bring it down a little bit, put the wire up into the second one, bring it down a little bit. Of course, you have to file it off, um, reduce it because it's gonna be in super occlusion. So you can use orthodontic veneers to straighten teeth and then also create a temporary situation where patients can save their money and then have it replaced. Same thing with the uh, implant. My goal is to have a twelve to fifteen hundred dollar implant and crown that the mass public can afford, and then if they want to go ahead and get the high cost implants, if they're old enough, they're not having those bony changes, then they go to a good company like Bio Horizons or Biomet or um, Zimmer. I, I took implant training, um, for, and, and I happened to practice with Dr. Ed Mills. He's another good one that you ought to have. Um, he's awesome too. He's taught more doctors implant dentistry than anybody that I know. He's, for 26 years, he ran the maxi course in uh, Atlanta, and I practiced with him in his office. So that's where I got introduced to implant dentistry in about 2005. And so um, I ended up taking the maxi course um, and then did my AAID. Um, so I'm associate fellow of the Im implant dentistry, but I can't do the next levels 
because I got to do bone grafting, I got to do extractions, I don't like needles, I don't like sutures, and I'm not going to do that. So I'm at the entry level in certification, but I use it for my uh, lectures and education. So the ortho veneers and, and the uh, tad plant kind of goes together, and um, I'll show you an example. And this is the case that my son is replacing the implants um, with uh, permanent biohorizons next week. This, these are the ortho crowns, and I designed it to put the tad plant palatal. Now, why would I want to put it palatal? Well, the crest is growing down and back, and also you want to preserve the buccal plate. I learned that from Dr. Mills, you know, when I was studying implant dentistry. So I put the implant back in the palate, and then I put a crown that I kind of hang off of it. When I take this and show it to labs, oh no, you have to have an emergence profile. That's not right. Well, I don't want an emergence profile. This is a temporary. You know, they put bone screws in uh, fixation in your back, you know, uh, to line your back up and so on. How many years have those bone screws been in patients? 20, 30, 40 years. Uh, and then there are articles I read where they can get them out easy. So I said, hello, I can do that with a regular implant. So that's what I did. And uh, so if you can see in the illustration here how the crown's designed a lot different, it's not put in ideally, it's put into the palate. And uh, then it does not harm the maxilla that is growing down about four to six millimeters and back about two. And that's from um, uh, Barents. Uh, he's the, uh, the head of the uh, AJO, not AJO, the American um, Journal of Orthodontics. He's the, um, and also he's the chairman at St. Louis. He's a very famous guy. And his early research showed that there's changes um, that happen in the 30s and the 40s and the 50s. He has a really good database. And uh, most dentists don't know about that because they're not orthodontists. Most orthodontists don't do implant dentistry because, you know, they don't want needle, they don't want sutures. And, and so I was very lucky that I just happened to be exposed to these people. That's why I came up with this concept. This is amazing. I don't know if it's amazing. I'm sure having a good time. <laughs> so what's your next step on your journey? Well, so tell us where you're at in your journey. What website can they go to today to learn more about you and what you're doing? Well, I'll, I'll send you to my son's two websites, affordablebraces.com and Dream Dental Services, DDS, DreamDentalServices.com. That's my two boys. Okay, uh, so what's the, first one, what's the first one you sent? Uh, Dream Dental Services, and then AffordableBraces.com is my son Jason. Uh, Georgia School of Orthodontics, you can go to their website. Uh, Jacksonville's um, website. Jacksonville was the largest orthodontic program in the country, probably the world. Uh, they had 15 residents every year and five fellows. And then Georgia School of Orthodontics opened up and we took 20 our first year and 18 last year. So we are very large orthodontic programs. And so we have dentists that come in from all over, uh, you know, mainly kids that get out of school that want to be orthodontists. And it's so great working with them because they're all video game uh, raised. And, and so the technology that we use, they can show us how to use it. And at Georgia School of Orthodontics, we take no impressions. Everything was uh, digitally scanned. So we have like four to five, three shapes. We have some care streams. And I don't know if we have any Iteros yet, but uh, I think we will be getting those. So, uh, go ahead. I said I'm no longer at the school because I uh, was made an offer at D4C that I could not refuse. So I, I practice 15 days a month with them. So, the, so tell us more about D4C. Okay, Dentistry for Children. They're um, based in Atlanta. Uh, it's a venture capital firm that bought out the venture capital firm that bought Dr. Pickering's practices when he retired and Dr. Eichel's practices. So they, they, they're the second VC that came in. And so supposedly this year we may grow to about 300 uh, sites. So let, let, let's talk about that because it seems like back in the day when, mm -hmm. you, when you and Cas Gaspar Lazarus, um, you know, you, you got a big line of credit, you started buying a bunch of orthodontic well, offices. It wasn't me that did that, it was Dr. Lazara that did it. I just happened to be at, at the place to learn. And, but you were an yeah. orthodontist during this time frame yes. and you were sitting yes. at the same table with him. Yes. And um, Proudly. <laughs> but but the, the, the end game, like people say, well, what is your exit strategy? What is your end game for your capital investment? It was to go public. Mm -hmm. Now it seems like what happens is a uh, private equity group that's in the 
five to ten million group will go start mm-hmm. a deal, mm-hmm. and then they'll flip it to a private equity and the, and the fifty million. That's and then what's happening. That's what's happening right now to a hundred million. Right. I, I mean, what is the end game? Is there eventually just going to be one hundred billion dollar equity fund that everybody sells to? I mean, what? Well, I how think do you get, how do you how do you you know you you don't want to get your money too far from cash. So how do they get how do they get their cash back? Well, it, right now, my, What's the end game? my son, Jonathan, is getting ready to double his practice. Uh, he's only had it, he's only in his second year of his, and he's going into his third. He's had two years behind him. He went from 175 to a million dollars in his second year. And he's uh, going to uh, merge with a, uh, um, see, what is it, a, a $1.7 million practice. So uh, I am here in Phoenix to go to the Dental Entrepreneurs uh, Summit. Um, which is at the JW Marriott. And, and, and now, whose summit is that? Uh, that's the, the Dental Entrepreneurs Organization. Can you can you send D- me that? D E O. And Dental Entrepreneurs Organization. Mm-hmm. Dental on and who's the writing leader uh, of that? Uh, Mark Cooper, I believe, is his name. He's, oh, Mark Cooper. Yeah, he's a periodontist. Yeah. Yeah, from uh, Seattle, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I think it was from Seattle. So this is his organization. Now, the reason I'm out here is we're going to have VCs lecturing. We're going to have uh, one guy that got eight times um, his gross for his practice. Uh, right now, Jonathan's telling me the, the corporation, not the corporations, the VCs are, are paying like four times cash flow. So Jonathan says, okay, $12 million in three years if I do this merger, and I'm going to sell out, and I'm going to Perio School. Uh, he, he wants to, he's 41 years old this, this uh, summer, and he uh, wants to go back to Perio School. And um, so I said, Jonathan, do it, do it. I mean, look at my age. I'm still, you know, I got to get back to the nursing home here in about a half hour. Will you give us a wait? Will you tell us your age? Uh, 74. And so what is your, um, do you still so want to do this for how much longer? What do I want to do when I grow up? I know. I don't want to ever grow up. Uh, I figure the, the minute I stop and go to try to have fun, uh, I'll probably have a heart attack or something. My mother is 95 years old. I just saw her last week. And her name is Lynette Choc Olette. She loves chocolate. So we gave her the middle name of Choc. So I took her some M&Ms when I saw her, and she just loves me because I brought her the M&Ms. But um, she was very active into her 80s. Uh, She was like a Rotarian, and she recruited more Rotarians than anybody in Brevard County, like 45, I think she recruited. So you just stay active. So I just, I, we have good genes, and I, I want my boys to work as long as they want to. They're not as crazy as me. They, they actually go on vacations. I, I go on learning vacations and let my wife shop while I'm li- listening to a lecture. But, but I want to I go back to uh, Mark Cooper. We've had him on mm-hmm. the show twice, right, Mark? Mm-hmm. Right, uh, Ryan? Find him real quick. Yeah, I think you're and uh, and um, so you were, you were... I mean, the, the, these kids, you know, they're, they're still um, just in dental school, just out. But you, you were back around when the original one started. Um, do you remember what year uh, Orthodontic Centers of America did their IPO? Well, I probably was in my, maybe my 10th year of um, practice, 72. So, so 80, 82, somewhere in that. 82. Yeah. So, so you've seen them go to the New York Stock Exchange mm-hmm. or a dozen on NASDAQ. Three times. I've been in three uh, offerings. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so what is it like? You graduated in 72. Now it's 2018. What does the DSO market look to you? What, what is your historical perspective? And then what is your predictiveness of where it will, where will it be in 10, 20, 30 I think years? it's going to be a huger uh, influence. Uh, because the kids coming out of school, you know, owe a half a million dollars. I mean, both my boys, three, three hundred and a half a million, I think, the other one, um, because they they were in school so long and, and they had to borrow, you know, money. And so this is a great opportunity for the kids. Plus, they get their experience. And sometimes you get into these organizations like me right now. Um, I just love it. They take care of everything. Um, we have such quality control. I mean, we have a compliance officer. Uh, that it's his full-time job to come out and make sure we're doing everything right by OSHA. Uh, our sterilization techniques are good. Uh, they take care of the staffing, the marketing, everything. And you have to have all those hats when you're doing your private practice, when you get out of school. And there's a big learning curve, you know, and, and then you have to go borrow at least two to $300,000 to open a dental office. So do you want to do a three to $500,000 school loan and then do another two or 300000 to open an office and take that kind of risk? So I think these uh, DMOs are going to be a bigger part 
of, of dentistry, and there's enough capital out there. I don't know where, I think it's a very good investment um, for these companies. Otherwise, they wouldn't be um, you know, trying to acquire offices and paying so much. So, so would your one son, you have two sons in dentistry, one's mm -hmm. an orthodontist and one's in implants. Mm -hmm. um, would you recommend to their sons that they be a part of a DSO versus an independent, privately owned office? I, I would. Um, right now they're young. They, um, they both married well, so one has a veterinarian and she's got a big practice, and the other has a tax attorney. So I, I had a wife that was, had all the kids, and she didn't bring any income in, but she was the best mother. She went to high school with every one of the kids about three or four times. You know, I'm so busy running around opening offices and working, and uh, she did a really good job of raising the kids. Um, so Are you my, still with her now? Oh, 43 years. Yeah. 43 yeah, years. Cheaper to keep her. Yeah. <laughs> cheaper to keep her? <laughs> no, she says that about me. She, she's, <laughs> the one, she's the one with the money. Um, but um, I don't think they'll get into uh, an organization like this until they um, see what it's like to start their own business and maybe sell a business. That's why my son Jonathan, if he does um, develop this into a three, four million dollar implant practice and somebody wants it, then uh, he'll, he'll be more than glad to Did go Did you see to the story School. on the cover of the Wall Street Journal um, last week about mm -hmm. the orthodontists in Utah that graduated from orthodontic school, $1 million in debt. Oh, that's... Did you see that article? I didn't see the article, but that's the truth. That's the truth. Yeah. Our kids are half of that, and it's, it's stressful because you got to pay that loan back over like 10 or 20 years. Because what, what people don't realize is that just as little as 10 years ago, I mean, mm -hmm. dental school is like 35000 a year. Then it exploded to seventy-five to 100000 a year. But remember, you know, they had their undergraduate debt. And then if you're paying 100000 a year for dental school, but ortho school's three years, mm -hmm. so that's another 100000 a year for three years, but then it's accumulating interest. So when he finally walked down the aisle with his, with his as a board, as an orthodontist, he was $1 million in debt. What yeah. kind of advice would you give to a kid like that? Become an implant dentist. You'll make more money, and it doesn't cost you as much. That's what I would do. In my so you don't, you don't, if, if, if some kid was listening to you in dental school, they were a junior or senior in dental mm -hmm. school, and they said... Um, Ortho, implant dentistry, perio. I, I would, uh, I, I really would push him towards learning about implants. And why, why is the grass greener with implants in ortho? It's, it's kind of a special skill set that not many dentists have. A lot of dentists have to send the patient to a periodontist to have it put in or, or an oral surgeon. Um, if you can learn how to do the whole enchilada, like my son does the all on four um, and, and hybrids, uh, he, he does all that. So, I mean, his cases will be like 25 to 25,000 in arch. Yeah, exactly. So, and you know what's weird about that? So, those all on fours, I got a bunch of friends mm -hmm. in my backyard that do these $25,000 an arch all mm -hmm. on four. Mm -hmm. And on a lot of Fridays, they'll do an upper and lower arch. So it's right. a $50,000 Friday. Mm -hmm. And the average American will buy a new car every five years between 16 and 76. Mm -hmm. Mean average price of that new car would be 33500 mm -hmm. One arch of an all on four is 25, the full mouse 50. And it's only about one in 20 dentists that every Friday, yeah. they, you know, they, they, they see all their regular stuff Monday through right. Thursday, then Friday's surgery day. And every Friday is a fifteen thousand to fifty thousand dollar case, mm -hmm. and they'll do it every Friday, fifty Fridays a year, their whole career. Mm -hmm. And then the other nineteen out of twenty dentists will never do one case the price of a new car their whole life. That's right. So That's what? Right. What? How, why, why is that? Talk get, about that. Get you, your you've been get, that. get your special training because first, first of all, do you agree with that? With what I just I said? I absolutely agree with that. Um, I, I would. Uh, like Dr. McCracken's course, I think it's like $28,000, but you actually go and do surgeries. Because when I took my implant training, I just sat in lectures and I watched Dr. Mills do the surgeries. And you could not, because you didn't have a license, I'm not talking about myself, but the other doctors, there's like 60 doctors. That Ryan, can you find McCracken's course in um, Prostos and, and Alabama? He's in Alabama. Yeah, it's it's called uh, let's uh, see, AIE. Prosthodontics and prosthodontics. Prosthodontist. He's, a, he's a prosthodontist. Yeah. McCracken Prosthodontist in Alabama, mm -hmm. and his course is how much? I think it's twenty eight thousand, but he has some entry level courses where you can put in four to six implants, and it's like five or six thousand. My son teaches with Dr. McCracken on those in Atlanta, 
Um, they, they have the, everybody comes to Atlanta, they get the lectures. Jonathan lectured with Dr. McCracken about. So McCracken's lecturing in Atlanta, but he's from Alabama? Right. They, they have maybe once or twice or three times a year they come and do it in Atlanta. And, and, they, and why would they go to Atlanta? Well, well, Al because Montgomery? Atlanta's a, it, no, the, they, their center is in Bessemer, which is kind of in a poor area of, um, of um, Birmingham. And they have a, a clinic called the Foundry Dental Clinic. And it's a wonderful organization. Uh, they, they have donations and so on. And, and Lutheran Medical actually funds the uh, 10 residents he has now. Jonathan was one of eight residents when he was there. He was the chief resident. And um, so they have the residents there every day to uh, pick up the suture lines that opened up you know, from the surgeries that were done on the weekend. You know, the sutures will open or a patient has an emergency. And also these uh, 10 doctors learn how to do sedation. So they will sedate the patient for you if, if you take the course. And so you can have sedated patients as you're doing the surgery. You'll learn how to do sinus lifts, um, bone grafting, um, multiple ex extractions, surgical extractions. I mean, it's a wonderful course. So become a dentist. Don't go to a $100,000 a year specialty program. Save up $28,000 or finance it and take a course like that. Uh, there's other courses where you can go offshore and do implants in foreign countries, too. So that's a good way to do it. Any you recommend? I re uh, well, um, I'm trying to think of some of them. Uh, I, I've been more exposed to um, Dr. <coughs> Dr. McCracken's course because he's near Atlanta. And then uh, Dr. Mills is in Atlanta as well. Um, Dr. Mills is not teaching the Maxi course anymore, but the Maxi course is a good course to take, and they're all over the country. And explain to them about the Maxi course program. Okay. The Maxi course is uh, kind of uh, endorsed and sponsored by the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. Uh, they actually have won court cases to where once you take the course and you get your certification, you can call yourself an implant dentist. Oh, my God. So, let's, so, you, you remember so that? that was the American Academy of Implant Dentistry. Right, AAID. And they're... Program is the maxi course teach how to do this. These are the ones mm -hmm. where one of their graduates in Texas. Remember, this is Texas. Texas mm -hmm. is a Texas is a different state than all the other states, mm -hmm. and they don't mess around in Texas. This guy's calling himself a specialist. So they, the board. American Dental Association is a tripartite system. So they have the ADA in Chicago for the country, then they have the state Air Dental Association mm -hmm. for the state of Texas. Then you have your little. Uh, it's a tripartite system. Well, they, they told him to quit call himself, especially because the ADA only recognized nine. Mm -hmm. And the guy said, well, I am an implant specialist. And, and so the, the ADA sued him. And the Texas judge said, the, the ADA, you're a membership organization. You're mm -hmm. not some government agency. Right. Who the hell are you to say you're a specialist? And they asked this guy, are you a specialist? He said, yeah, all I do is implants. Mm -hmm. This case goes. That was the death, the ADA's overreaching. Mm -hmm caused the death of the specialty. Right. So now, um, so I know people, um, and I've been knowing people that have been doing this for 30 years, where they say, okay, well, I'm not a board-certified endodontist, but I'm in a town of eight people in the middle of New Mexico, and the other seven hate molar endo, and I hate doing kids and crowns and veneers and all mm -hmm. that. So they just say practice limited to endodontics. Right. And they just do their endo, like they were endodontists, board certified specialists. And by the way, some of the biggest legends in endodontics, like the guy who invented Thermophil, uh, Ben Johnson, Tulsa, Oklahoma, Tulsa mm -hmm. Dental Company, he never went to endo school. Yeah. Uh, probably the smartest one that ever lived was John McSpadden in Chattanooga, mm -hmm. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. He never went to endo school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He just said, I'm just doing endo. Mm -hmm. So you're saying come out of dental school and just learn implants. Learn implants. Um, and, and then you, they, they are going to probably have specialty programs set up because people are asking to have a, ADA will probably get behind something and, and have a specialty in implant dentistry. Well, 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 but let's talk about one more thing on that. Mm -hmm. We talked about um, Align Technology with owners of Isla and Niterra mm -hmm. and they bought 17% of Smalls Drug Club. Do you think it sh it's legal? I mean, because I was worried about, okay, I'm going to die. Yeah. And then I got my grandchildren. Mm -hmm. So Taylor's five. When she's 18, I'm sitting here wondering, is it really going to be cool for her to go to a mall and some beautician oral scans and they, and they send the impressions to Costa Rica and, and, and can Taylor get ortho without an orthodontist ever looking at her? I, I don't mean, know the answer to legality <laughs> of it. That's all right. Yeah, um, is that your girlfriend or your broker? No, um, I, I, sold, <laughs> I sold one of my waterfront lots and that's the guy telling me something, so I'll, I'll call him later. Um, so. Anyways, uh, 
If you say anything disparaging about Smile Club Direct, they will sue you. They will drag you into court. And that's Smile what, Direct Club disparaging. Yes. Don't say anything. No, don't say anything. <laughs> don't say anything. You know, because uh, I think they're fighting it out right now with the state boards on whether right. the, uh, this is legal. But they supposedly have orthodontists on staff that monitor every case. So I don't know how you can do that, but that's fine. That, that, that's Tell the dentistry. It's, it's, well, teledentistry is going to be the future, and telemedicine is going to be the future. So maybe companies like this need to be out there and test the waters, and then it'll get regulated to protect the public. But somebody's got to, you know, uh, be the pioneer. That's the guy with the arrow is in his back. All right. So many dentists think they're a legend, and I'm like, um, okay. So how many arrows have been shot in your back, and for mm -hmm. what reasons? Oh, I've never been sued. And no one's ever shot an arrow in my back. Then you're not a pioneer. That's right. Dude, the, these are monkeys. If you climb the tree to the highest of the tree, you'll get hit by all the coconuts and bananas. And if you're not getting an arrow shot in your back, you're not saying anything exactly. revolutionary. Yeah. And what they're doing, this telemedicine, mm -hmm. uh, it's revolutionary. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's the internet, it's the scanners, mm -hmm. it's different countries. It's uh, So where, where, where do you think you'll end up? Where's your prediction 10 years from now? Well, 10 years from now, that's about the time I may retire, maybe. Well, here's, here's my prediction is that um, <laughs> the most confusing thing is when you're little, you think you live in the United States of America. Mm -hmm. And when you live around the world, you think that the United States of America is this country. And it's no more of a country than the EU. And in the EU, you don't compare Germany to Greece. You don't compare Portugal to Sweden to Denmark. It's like... The EU is like 20 countries flying under a flag. So what will happen in the United States is there's 50 states, there's 50 different dental societies, there's 50 different attorney generals, and they will, one state will end up being the McDonald's, one will be the In-N-Out Burger, mm -hmm. one will be Burger mm -hmm. King, one will be Wendy's. And that's one of the secret sauces of America is that if it was one country and the feds made you do everything one way, well, how would you know which was the best fast food restaurant? That's right. That's why I hate the Department of Education. Yeah. Because the Department of Education is like trying to tell American schools they all have to be a McDonald's. And you know what? Some states need a McDonald's, some need a Burger King, some need a Wendy's, mm -hmm. some need a Sonic Drive-In, some need an In-N-Out Burger, some need a Whataburger. And, and then watching other states trying to do it different things, and you let that roll out for 10 years, mm -hmm. then you sit back and say, well, you know what? We got, we got 50 states. 10 of them are doing this differently. Mm -hmm. But you know what? It looks like the trade-off is here. So the states that do this, this is what they get. Because nothing's right or wrong. Well, like hygienists, it's just a trade-off. You know, hygienists uh, having their own practices. I mean, that's now common. Hygienists giving shots, um, giving injections. I loved it. When I was doing my implant uh, work uh, as an orthodontist, I'm, I might have a, a TAD plant patient over here, and I'd have my hygienist, would you do a little infiltration for me? You know, so I wouldn't have to leave the yeah, room. But, but see, it's the same. When, mm -hmm. when you're our age, you just keep seeing the arthritis. Do you mm -hmm. remember what it was like? when they tried to get hygienists passed. Yeah. Do you remember how the redneck conservative hillbillies are yeah. like, oh my God, no, what you're gonna get, you're gonna license her to clean you, that's my sacred sovereign that's right. They fought hygienists like hygienists were Hitler's twin sister. Yeah. And now, none of them wanna go back and do their own cleanings. Yeah. They don't want to just do it. Yeah. And now here's the same rodeo again, dental right. therapist. Right. What are they gonna do? They're gonna do fillings. Well, most all my friends don't want to ever do a filling again. They, they, so now, well, let's so, hope they do so we can concentrate on implants. Right. So, so all <laughs> these dental therapists that I've seen graduate so far, first of all, the dentist says, oh, yeah, this is great, man. Now I got rooms one and two is a dental hygienist. Mm -hmm. Rooms three and four is a dental therapist. You say, what's the difference? Well, the hygienist is getting $40 an hour, does the cleanings and, mm -hmm. and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. The dental <clears> therapist is <throat> going there numb prep all the fillings, do all the fillings. They're paying them both the same wages, about 40 bucks an hour, and the hygienist is getting paid 40, doing a $55 cleaning. The dental therapist is getting paid 40, doing a $125 filling, and a lot of them are doing two in an hour. I can't find any dentist that doesn't like dental therapists, but 50 state dental societies all think that it's, it. it's, it's the end of dentistry. Yeah. Well, would you rather be in there doing an MO? And by the way, I want to tell you, one of the hardest hours in dentistry is when you walk into a room and you got an MOD on two, three, four, and five. And you're like, are you shitting me? I mean, that's an hour. Yeah. And when you're done, you, I need a nap. Mm -hmm. I'm 55. Mm -hmm. I need a nap after yeah. that. And, and, and who's fighting that? All, mm -hmm. all my homies. Do you know how long it takes to put one of these TAD plants in? How long? Two minutes. And how much does it cost? Uh, well, I've been... What would the fee be? Well, the fee will be about $1,500 with the crown and the implant. 
Yeah. But that's all the prosthetic. But you know, see, they don't yeah. want to do that. They, they want to ban hygienists and dental therapists. Mm -hmm. They want to do cleanings all morning and MOD direct fillings all afternoon. Well, I, I'd like, like to see um, centers like the Orthodontic Care Centers of America where the prices were cheaper so that the public you know, could afford it. I'd like to see that in implant dentistry sooner than later. Because right now, it's kind of an elite um, specialty. Well, let's talk about that. So mm -hmm. you, how, many, how many countries have you been lectured in around the world? Uh, I'm not as many as you. But, but if you ever have an extra seat on your uh, jet, I'll go with you. But No, I'll go with you. Because six, six, maybe six or eight six, countries, yeah. Okay, in those six or eight countries, Koreans, mm -hmm. three out of four general dentists placed in plasma. Yeah. Germany, right? Brazil, we're way behind. Portugal, yeah. I mean, you almost the the only, and I'm like, well, which countries at the bottom of the list? And by the way, if you want to know this kind of thing, a lot of people say, Howard, where did you hear that, or where did you learn that? Do do these companies are publicly traded? Invisalign's publicly traded. You buy one share of any of these dental companies, uh, Strawman, uh, mm -hmm. um. um who owns Noble BioCare and Implants Direct, Danaher. Mm -hmm. These are all publicly traded. You buy one share of stock, they have to send you the 10Q quarterly every quarter, the 10K annual report, and the data is mesmerizing. It's like my favorite letter of the year is uh, Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway letter. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I can say that anymore because now Jamie Dimon has uh, an amazing letter too. Mm -hmm. But, but, one of the things that Strawman stock is trading so well is because if America caught up to the median average implant place of just Korea, Germany, and Brazil, all these implant companies will be doing three or four times the volume. Yes. So my question to you is, why are American general dentists at the bottom of the barrel? Why is implant penetration amongst the 325 million American citizens, implants per 100,000, Almost the lowest. You almost got to be a developing regulation, nation. To regulation. Be that low. What is Trump doing now? He's taking regulations off, and the economy is booming. If we could take some of the regulations off of of dentistry, you know, so tightly monitored, like the FDA trying to get something approved. Now that they're loosening up on that. Oh, don't start the FDA with yeah. me. But you, that, that's you, the reason. But do you realize this house? Mm -hmm. You know what? When I bought this house, you know why I bought the house? Mm -hmm. Because an American who had paid her taxes her whole life had a brain cancer, mm -hmm. and American Pharmaceutical had a cure, or a, a treatment, uh, but the FDA didn't approve it mm -hmm. for American citizens. So she sold this house, took her money to Scandinavia, where she had to go finish the rest of her life, and, and, uh, and she had to sell this to buy a home in Scandinavia, because yeah. she was an American, and it's like, well, I understand that the FDA- oh, for the health care. Well, no, she couldn't buy, she couldn't get the only drug for her brain cancer. And the FDA said, no, it's, it's under a study. Okay. And then she said, well, they're selling it in Switzerland. Oh, yeah, but this is not Switzerland. So she had to move. She had to sell this house to me. I mean, so it, it's always the government. It's like, okay, I understand if you say, hey, Howard, this drug is an FDA approved. Okay, I get it. But I'm the one dying of cancer, not you. I want to try it anyway. Oh, no. Oh, no. 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 Well, you've been to, I mean, you've been like, to many what countries. Is wrong with these every, people? We think that everybody's so backward and we're so great in, in the USA. I mean, when I went to uh, Columbia, Bogota, uh, they had uh, 3D imaging before many of us did. And, uh, of course, they were buying their machines a little cheaper than we were buying our machines. Um, they have uh, so much experience. They go out into the Pueblos and, and work on the... Uh, Every year when, a, when a, a dental student graduates from a school in Columbia, they have to give one year back to the government and go out and, and work on the people. We, you know, we, we should have things like that. In Germany, they're amazing over there with, with their technology. The Israelis, you know, they're, they're, they're fantastic. We think we're the best in the world. Well, here, here's we're how not. the American <laughs> government works. The American mm -hmm. government says, You're, you, the, you people are dumb, and when you retire, you'll have Social Security. Mm -hmm. But we, the government, we're smart. So mm -hmm. we will make decisions for you, and when we retire, we get Social Security and a government pension. Mm -hmm. So they double dip on the pension, and they're never there. They're kind of like dental insurance companies. Mm -hmm. Dental insurance companies aren't helping you. Mm -hmm. They're trying to control you. Yeah. They're saying, well, we'll only pay $100 for this filling, and nobody can charge more, and if they charge more, they're out of network. We're gonna, you know, they'll do. You know, it's, the, the government's not saying, "Hey, Howard, I want, I want to help you. This drug you're trying is not FDA approved. It's yeah. brand new." Mm -hmm. And then I can sit here and say, "Well, I have terminal brain cancer, yeah. and I'm down to 
You know, crystals mm -hmm. in Sedona mm -hmm. are this American-made pharmaceutical. This guy has spent his life doing this. I want to try it. And then think how much that speeds up your research. Because instead of doing research on rats and monkeys and mice and rabbits mm -hmm. who don't have our DNA. I mean, I found out three days ago that I'm actually not a chimpanzee. And I'm not a mouse. And I'm not. And me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so why, why, but I, I, I draw the line at violence when she has to leave the country mm -hmm. to get a drug from an American-made pharmacy. I mean, I, yeah, I just think that's yeah. repulsive. So that is probably the reason why we're not uh, as progressive as, as some of the other yeah. countries. But we can learn from them. I, I belong to an organization, Dental XP. Are you familiar with them out mm -hmm. of Atlanta? That's the uh, Sol Solama. Yeah. Uh, Ron uh, Goldstein. Yeah, Ronnie Goldstein. And uh, Solama. The Salama yeah. brothers, yeah. The Salama brothers, yeah. Ronald Goldstein, and who was and, the other and, one? Um, um, David uh, Garber. David Garber. I yeah. love all three of those they guys. Are great guys. And love Ronnie, them all. Ronnie Goldstein was the first cosmetic dentist I ever went to when I uh, moved, just got out of dental school, moved to Atlanta to teach at Emory. How I, many Salama brothers are there? Uh, there's two. two. No, no, no. There's three. Eddie uh, Salama runs the uh, dental XP. They have a great series of lectures, and people from all over the country come in. And of course, you know Christian Coachman. I, I've I've gone in his courses in Atlanta. Coachman? Oh no, at um, Salama. Oh, Salama. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah, and yeah they're, they're excellent. And then Coachman was uh, Christian Coachman. He has the uh, Smile Design software. Yep. And you ought to see what out of Brazil. Out of uh, at, San Paulo, Yeah, Brazil. he's out of Brazil. His father, I think, was a lab tech. His and, father? Are you kidding me? There's 35 people in his pedigree. I mean, they're, 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 they're big, it's big Brazilian Portuguese yeah. families, but there's 35 people in mm -hmm. his family tree yeah. that are dentists, orthodontists, hygienists, assistants, yeah. lab techs. Lab, it's it's an amazing. He, he is a family. rock star presenter. Yeah. Whenever he comes, he, he has like a entourage, and and I I was on a program. Um, he was there, and I was on the program. I was talking to him in the hallway, and he said, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't have much time to talk. i got to go catch a plane. I'm going to either Brazil or Europe or Africa or so somewhere. So when I lectured with him at um, mm -hmm. New York City, he was on a one-year tour where he was going to go home. He was going to go home like three times in that year. Wow. wow. For like, I mean, it's crazy. Have you seen some of their videos uh, where they make them in Romania, and they, they do the... Um, the makeup, and they have these beautiful women that their teeth are kind of like yucky, and then they do the smile design on them, and then they do the rest restoration. When I give my lectures, I, I get some of those videos to show what's possible, and they're, that's good marketing. They're doing that in other countries. We should be doing it here, too. Yeah. And I'm sure some of the doctors are doing it because they're, uh, he has a good following here in the U.S., too. Uh, every country. Yeah. Every country. And he started with Ronnie Goldstein's practice. Right, and then who's the other cosmetic dentist, Ryan, that... Um uh, Mike Appa. Is it Mike Appa? Yeah, with Rosenthal Group. Oh my God. So I had to follow that guy in, um, what was it, Cambodia? Um, Cambodia it or Medan, Malaysia? Indonesia. It was where? Medan, Indonesia. Oh my God. I mean, it was like, it was, <laughs> you'd never want to follow that guy in, in Malaysia. I mean, it was just like, they, they clapped for like 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. And he had to stand there because in Asia, every single dentist will have to get a selfie with you. Yeah. I mean, the, the after the lecture entourage for APA was an hour. Yeah. Well, well, um, another uh, up-and-coming guy, uh, Chris Chang, he's, he's out of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. We've had all these guys on the show. Uh, he is awesome. With bone screws. With, and he has his own bone screw. Yeah. yeah so, 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 just for the kids who don't know, what what is the difference in an implant and a bone screw? I thought you'd never ask. Let me show you. <laughs> this is a bone screw that is used like a TAD right here. See how small. And don't it use the wrong TAD. TAD stands for a temporary anchor device. Okay. Now, actually, I was going to call my TAD plant. Bad, B-A-D, a bone anchor device. Nice. But I don't want to call it bad because I, I won't sell any of them. So that, see how small that is? And then the TAD, I, I think I showed you, you should have it over right. here. It's a little bigger, but most TADs are one piece. The one that Dr. Chang talks about is one piece. And then also his is designed with a square hex, kind of for getting it in and out. And then he's really smart because he puts them into the, uh, in the buckle shelf and in the uh, zygomatic area instead of inner radicular and, and, and I always have put mine in that way. I was wondering, you know, why and um, 
he's the one that you know says you it's a, a little safer to do it that way and um, he's done a lot in implant dentistry and he has a group that he has lots of surgeries and his videos are awesome and, and he's on YouTube so so let me that's the final question because we've gone way over an hour um, mm -hmm. Why do so many orthodontists and oral surgeons in America fix so many um, class twos and class threes with surgeries and Lafort fracture surgeries when in Taiwan this guy does it all day long without any surgery? Do you agree with that assessment or not? Well, yes and no. Do, do you agree? Do you think that Americans use more orthodontic surgery than the Taiwanese? Well, Probably yes. Okay, now, this is the typical case for ortho veneers, but this is something that I've been doing for years called the Mew technique. Right. Multi looped edgewise arch wire. And what you do is you bend up the wires that look like this and it closes the bite down. They wear some rubber bands and the wires, uh, this was invented uh, Dr. Kim uh, in uh, Asia. I think it was um, uh, Korea. I think he's Korean. Sato Kim, or maybe it's Sato and Kim. So if orthodontists know how to bend wire, the young orthodontists don't bend wire anymore because everything's preformed, everything's this high-tech uh, metal now. We had to bend wire back in the old days. And so if you knew this technique here, you can, this is a surgical case, open bite. It was treated with mu. My son, who's not even an orthodontist, Jonathan sent me a case the other day. Uh, in three months, he closed the bite down. And uh, he used the mu. He, he bent the mu up. I see. My boys worked for me as dental assistants since they were nine or ten. They've been in my office, and so when they got out of dental school or they were on summer break or whatever, they're, they're bending wire. They're treating patients under me, and it was so nice that I could sit and train them. Every day I get a text or something from you know one of the boys. Well, Dad, what would you do for this case? That's why I'm going to live another 47 years. Ryan, what podcast was the mu technique? We just did the orthodontics. Where was she from? What country? The new technique? The MU, MEAW. So you, you've already done what a was the female orthodontist we just did about uh, the. Cassidy? Yeah, from where? Italy. Yeah, she's a MU legend in Italy. And, um, mm -hmm. But see, that's another classic example of why you don't want government regulation like the Department of Education because the Taiwanese are doing these. Sur these orthodontic surgery cases that Americans do, they're doing them with bone screws in Taiwan. In Italy, and, and they're mu. doing them with the mu technique. Well, we're doing it with mu in the yeah. U.S. too, because I've uh, done And when the government tells like you that. that everybody has to have it done this way, every, every, I mean, imagine, um, I saw the funniest meme yesterday. It was um, BMWs, every two seat car from 1950 to 2015, and then above it, the Russian, their car, mm -hmm. every year. So mm -hmm. for the, the Russian car every year was the same for 50 years. Yeah. And the BMW just looked like it evolved from a, a chimpanzee to a homo sapien. <laughs> and when you do regulation, you never know what you have. Um, you'll see that in France. France had a nuclear regulatory agency when they only had one approved react, uh, uh, um, reactor. Mm -hmm. The United States, every different... The utility company built a different reactor. Well, guess what? After 30, 40, 50 years, that guess which industry is more thriving and which industry knows which reactors work better for which reasons and right. So, so um, there's diversity. I mean, that's even how uh, evolution works. You mm -hmm. know, you have 20 different kids with 20 different phenotypes, and you mm -hmm. see which one survives. Well, I think that the dental student should be a CE junkie and should go to everything they can go to. Uh, they can go ahead and uh, call on the uh, the older dentists in the neighborhood uh, and um, you know get to know somebody that can mentor them. Our association has a, a mentorship for orthodontists that want to mentor. You know, we're, we have we're listed is this on the, the site. AID? This is the A A A O, the American Association of Orthodontists. So I have like three or four uh, students. So the A A O has a mentorship program yeah, yeah. for general dentist? No, no, it's for orthodontists. Wow. Oh. But I mean, it, I'm talking about Sorry. general dentistry. Sorry, I can't Ahead of myself. You can do it in general dentistry. Uh, you could right. have a mentorship program. Right. I ADA tell that could, all the time. Could put it together. They always I mean, want to jump in That's what you're doing. That's your business. You're, yeah. you're a mentor. You're teaching these kids uh, the business and of dentistry. And you hear what he said? Go across the street. Your mentor lives across the street. That's if, right. If you have to get an airplane to fly to your mentor, I don't think he's your mentor. Find well, some guy. I mean, come on. You're 25. You're 30. You're 35. How old are you? 74? 74, Actually, 55. Why, why do you have to get on Southwest Airlines and fly 300 bucks to go get a mentor? 
Yeah. And that mentor is not going to be there. across the street or join the uh, dental yeah. society. And when you got an upset patient and something goes mm -hmm. south, that your mentor, that your patient's not going to fly to your mentor. Start a study club. Yeah. I mean, those are things like in Seattle, like the Seattle Study Club just blew up and, and, and took off. And um, th those things are available and they don't cost the money it would be to become a special. And learn the special skill set, implant dentistry, go to the implant meetings too. They're, they're fantastic. And they're international. I mean, we have people from all over the world that come and, and lecture. Well, tell Mark Cooper I said hi. I shall. And um, so where is this meeting at? It's at the uh, JW Marriott. Is that in Scottsdale? I think so. I don't know the, the city. I think it's just like uh, one mile from the border of Scottsdale, and uh, that's what the lady okay. at the front well, desk is. Uh, tell him I said hello, and mm -hmm. I want to thank you so much for coming by the house. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. My it's an honor to and we, meet um, the legend, legends here. <laughs> and uh, Ryan is a legend. Mm -hmm. uh, I am the father of the Ryan legend. And mm -hmm. But, hey, if you ever want to build this online CE course, we've put up 400 courses on Dentaltown, mm -hmm. and they're coming up on a million views. Wow. So if you wow. really want to take everything you've learned from mm -hmm. 72 to 2018, and uh, the, the millennials like one-hour segments. Mm -hmm. um, it's kind of overwhelming to think, okay, I'm going to go to a course an eight-hour course on Friday, yeah. let alone I'm going to have to fly across the country and a two-day course, and it's mm -hmm. four grand. But when you sit there and say, God dang, I'm not doing nothing. It's Saturday afternoon. I just barbecued a hot dog. I'm going to, I'm going mm -hmm. to watch this hour course. Mm -hmm. So the hour, hour and a half courses, are they're not overwhelming. But an hour is better. Sweet, an hour, an hour is better, mm -hmm. and um, you know when they listen to something for you know eight hours, their mm -hmm. brains are. But thank you so much for coming My by. My pleasure. All My right, pleasure. buddy. Thank you.